Dear Heavenly Father, we just ask and pray that you please be with us for this, this worship hour. Please send me your Holy Spirit. Help you to be lifted up. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Okay. Um, sermon title is Our Mighty Mediator. Our Mighty Mediator. During the latter part of the Civil War, President Abraham Lincoln was often seen among the troops who suffered terrible casualties. The number of soldiers who felt they had met Lincoln personally in late 1864 ran into many thousands. Every refused, he would dismount from his horse, walk along the company lines, and shake hands with the soldiers in the front rank, and go clear to the back file, and spoke such words as, glad to see you looking so well, boys, glad to meet you. Towards the end of the war, Lincoln's Secretary of War Stanton urged strict justice and retribution for the Confederates. This incident is told of Lincoln. The President once dropped a few kind words about the enemy. They were human beings, were they not? One could not be completely remorseless even in war. The line must be drawn somewhere. An elderly woman in the reception room flashed a question. How could he speak kindly of his enemies when he should rather destroy them? What, madam, slowly, slowly as he gazed into her face, do I not destroy them when I make them my friends? Lincoln's general's demands for execution of deserters and enemy captives were often countermanded by Lincoln. One time, a sobbing old man came to Lincoln and told him that his son, with General Butler's army had been convicted of a crime and sentenced by court martial to be shot. General Butler had sent Lincoln a telegram urging him not to interfere with any army court martial. The dazed old man shook with desperate grief. Lincoln, watching a minute, said, By James Butler or no Butler, here goes. Mm -hmm. And he wrote a few words. He showed them to the old man, a presidential signed order, that the son was not to be shot until further orders from me. The old man was still in grief. I thought it was to be a pardon. But you say not to be shot till further orders, and you may order him shot next week. Lincoln smiled. Well, my old friend, I see you are not very well acquainted with me. If your son never looks on death till further orders come from me to shoot him, he will live to be a great deal older than the Fusilla. <laughs> Lincoln's reversal of execution orders and granting of pardons was legendary. A wife of a Confederate cavalryman who was due to be shot came to Lincoln with her story. The president asked about her husband's character. Did he get drunk? Did he beat her and the children? No, no, said the wife. He's a good husband. He loves me and the children. She was from the north, her husband from the south. Well, said Lincoln as he thumbed through the papers, I will pardon your husband and turn him over to you for safekeeping. Here the woman broke into tears, into a sobbing beyond control. My dear woman, if I had known how badly it was going to make you feel, I never would have pardoned him. <laughs> you don't understand me, she cried between, between sobs and a fresh flow of tears. Yet, yes I do. And if you don't go away at once, I shall be crying with you. <laughs> once a woman knelt to give thanks for the release of her husband. Don't kneel to me. But thank God and go, was the president's dismissal of her. If he has no friend, I'll be his friend, was Lincoln's remark as he once signed a pardon. Friends, we too need a friend in high places, do we not? Amen. Our sentence in the eyes of heaven is death. Romans 6, 23, for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God, of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Our adversary, Satan, demands that we be destroyed. He demands that we be paid our wages. We need a friend in the White House in heaven, the heavenly court, who will take us under his wing, plead our case, and sign our pardon. Today I want to look at our mediator, who is at the right hand of the throne of God, offering pardon to all who plead with him to take their case. Our verse today is 1 Timothy 2, verse 5. For there is one God and one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. Several other translations say there is only one God. There is but one God. Scripture repeatedly tells us there is only one God to be worshipped. 
the triune God, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. 1 John 5, 7, for there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, and these three are one. Deuteronomy 6, 4, hear, O Lord, the Lord our God is one Lord. Literally, Jehovah is our God, Jehovah is one. God tells us in Exodus 23, you shall have no other God before me. The God of the New Testament is the same God of the Old Testament. Jesus prayed in John 17, 3, and this is life eternal, that they may know thee the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent. There is only one God, friends. There is only one gospel plan. There are not two ways of salvation, one for the Jews and one for the New Testament. There is only one seed of Genesis 3.15, whereby we are saved. All are saved by only one faith. There is only one Sabbath, not two. Romans 3, 29 and 30. Is he God of the Jews only? Is he not also of the Gentiles? Yes, of the Gentiles also, seeing it is one God, which shall justify the circumcision by faith and the uncircumcision through faith. There is only one way to be saved. The evangelicals have two gospel plans, one for people now and one for people later, but there's only one. Ephesians 4, there is one body, one spirit, is even as you are called in one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above all and through all and in you all. And this one faith, this one gospel plan has to have a mediator because we read in 1 Timothy 2, 5, there is one God and one mediator between God and man. The gospel plan must include a mediator, a heavenly high priest. This heavenly high priest ministers in the heavenly sanctuary. This is the distinctive truth of the Seventh-day Adventist message. You know, there are other churches that recognize and keep the Seventh-day Sabbath, but the Adventist church is the only one that teaches the gospel through the sanctuary message. 1 Timothy 2.5, there is one God and one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. What is a mediator? And why is a mediator between God and man necessary? One Adventist author states the English word mediator is taken from the Latin, the church Latin. The term comes from meaning in the middle, in the midst of. A mediator is one found in the middle, a go-between for both parties. The Greek word translated mediator is mesites, derived from the adjective meaning in the middle. A mediator establishes a relationship that otherwise would never exist. A mediator represents each of the two parties to the other and brings them together. Why do we need a mediator? First of all, there's a huge difference between fallen mankind and God the Father. God is infinite. 1 Timothy 1.17, now unto the king, eternal, immortal, invisible, the only wise God. 1 Timothy 6, who is the blessed and only potentate, the king of kings and lord of lords, who only hath immortality. God is purity. God alone has immortality. God is complete righteousness. We are fallen. We are unholy. We are sinful. Isaiah 59, 2, in the Jerusalem Bible says, But your iniquities have made a gulf between you and your God. Your sins have made him veil his face so as not to hear you. There's sin in the middle between us and our mediator. Job prayed for a mediator. He says, He is not a man as I am, that I should answer him, and that we should come together in judgment. Neither is there any days when he tricks us, that he may lay his hand upon us both. The word daysman comes from the word day, and it was the day when the judge and jury met. The word daysman describes the judge, the empire, who, the umpire who settles the dispute and brings two parties together. Job said, I need a daysman. I need a mediator. Ellen White said, when we study the divine character in the light of the cross, we see mercy, tenderness, and forgiveness, blended with equity and justice. We see in the midst of the throne one bearing in hands and feet and side the marks of the suffering endured to reconcile man to God. We see a Father infinite, dwelling in light unapproachable, but he receives us to himself through the merits of his Son. 
The cloud of vengeance that threatened only misery and despair and the light reflected from the cross reveals the writing of God. God says, live, sinner, live. I have paid a ransom. God himself bridged the gulf between you and me and himself. We could not bridge this alienation. Our minds are darkened. It is our fear. It is our misapprehension of God that needs to be overcome. God himself is love. The Bible teaches that God himself took the initiative in bridging the gap between himself and us. He appointed a mediator in the person of Jesus Christ. The function of a mediator is to represent God to men and men to God in order to bring about our salvation, our reconciliation. And the mediator has to have an intimate knowledge of both sides in order to bring them together. Ellen White says the highest angel in heaven couldn't be our mediator. They were created beings. The mediator had to be one who was equal with God, who possessed attributes that would dignify and declare him worthy to treat with the infinite God in man's behalf. Man's substitute and surety must also have man's nature, a connection with the human family who he was to represent. As God's ambassador, he must be of a divine nature and he must be of a human nature. And it's only in Christ that we have this divinity with humanity. The Phillips translation says that there is only one God and one intermediary between God and men, Jesus Christ, the man. Jesus Christ, the man God, the God man. Not only in the New Testament, but throughout all salvation history, all the actions of God with respect to the human race were only through Christ. He made the world. Hebrews 1-2, by whom also he made the worlds. John 1-3, all things were made by him. And without him was not anything made that was made. Paul gives a list, everything in heaven and in earth, visible and invisible. And all things even now are held together by him. Hebrews 1.3, upholding all things by the word of his power. Colossians 1.17, and he is before all things, and by him all things consist or hold together. We are sustained through our mediator. Christ is the mediator, has been the mediator throughout all salvation history, from the Old Testament times even until now. And patriarchs and prophets and all these revelations of the divine presence, the glory of God was manifested through Christ. Not alone at the Savior's advent, but through all the ages after the fall and the promise of redemption, God was in Christ reconciling the world into himself. Christ was the foundation and center of the patriarchal sacrificial system. Christ was the one who followed Israel in the wilderness. It says of the Old Testament prophets in 1 Peter 1.11 that the spirit of Christ was in the prophets. The Old Testament has many references to the angel of the Lord. It was Christ who first appeared to Abraham when he was about to slay Isaac. Genesis twenty two fifteen, and the angel of the Lord called unto Abraham out of heaven. It was with Christ that Jacob wrestled at the brook Jabbok, and he said, I have seen God face to face, and my life is preserved. Ellen White says it was Christ, the angel of the covenant, who revealed himself to Jacob. It was Christ that appeared to Moses at the burning of the book, at the burning bush. And Moses said, moreover, I am, and Moses said that God said, moreover, he said, I am the God of thy father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look upon God. It was Christ who was the angel of the covenant. It was Christ who was in the pillar of cloud by day and the pillar of fire by night. All the communion between heaven and the fallen race has been through Christ. It was the Son of God that gave to our first parents the promise of redemption. It was he who revealed himself to the patriarchs, Adam, Noah, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and Moses. And they understood the gospel. They looked for salvation through man's substitute and surety. The incarnation was God's supreme revelation of himself as mediator. The incarnation revealed the essence of Christ. Christ was come to bridge the gap between us and God. 
by lifting the separation which sin had made. The angel said to Joseph in Matthew 1, 21, And thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sin. Scholars say Jesus translates to Jehovah is salvation. Jesus is the Greek form of the Hebrew Joshua. Joshua, the captain of salvation, who led Israel into the promised land. Joshua, the high priest in Zechariah, who contended with Satan and overcame him for God's people. Christ is the only true mediator. He was the full revelation of God to us. John 1.18, no man hath seen God at any time. The only begotten Son, which is in the bosom of the Father, he hath declared him. Jesus says, he that has seen me has seen the Father. The opening paragraph of Desire of Ages says, the light of the knowledge of the glory of God is seen in the face of Jesus Christ. From the days of eternity, the Lord Jesus Christ was one with the Father. He was the image of God, the image of his greatness and majesty, the outshining of his glory. It was to manifest this glory that he came to our world. Through this sin-darkened earth, he came to reveal the light of God's love, to be God with us, to make God's thought audible to us. And Christ still is exercising his supreme power in this present world. 1 Corinthians 15, For he, Christ, must reign till he hath put all enemies under his feet. And at the end, he will deliver up the kingdom to his Father. The goal of Christ's mediatorial work is a world cleansed of sin and completely reconciled to God. Christ's mediatorial work has bigger implications than we usually give it thought to. Christ came to bridge the sin gulf, and he will ever bear throughout eternity his humanity. Ellen White says in Desire of Ages, by his life and death, Christ has achieved even more than recovery from the ruin wrought through sin. It was Satan's purpose, Satan's desire to cut us off from the Father completely. But she says, in Christ we are more closely united to God than if we had never fallen. Amen. In taking our nature, the Savior has bound himself to humanity by a tie that is never to be broken. Through the eternal ages, it says, he will be God with us. To give him not only to bear our sins, and die as our sacrifice. God gave him to the fallen race to assure us of his immutable counsel of peace. God gave his only begotten son to be, become one of the human family forever to retain his human nature. Now to us today, the most important aspect of Christ's mediatorial work is that he represents us as a priest king upon the throne in heaven. When Christ defeated Satan at Calvary, he arose from the grave and ascended on high. When Jesus ascended from the tomb, he ascended, he assumed a different body that he had while he was here on earth. That new body had new and surprising powers. Christ could suddenly appear just out of nowhere among his disciples. Luke 24, and Jesus himself stood in the midst of them and saith unto them, Peace be unto you. And just as suddenly he could disappear. It says that while the two disciples of them walked to Emmaus were eating with him, and their eyes were opened, and they knew him, and he vanished out of their sight. An Adventist author says it's evident that our Lord's body had been transformed into the spiritual body Paul describes in 1 Corinthians 15, 44. It is so in a natural body, it is raised a spiritual body. There is a natural body, and there is a spiritual body. Christ made several post-resurrection appearances to his disciples, and then he finally took formal leave, telling them he would be present with them through his Holy Spirit. And don't despair, he said. I will come back again, and I am always with you even unto the end of the world. The angels assured them and said in Acts 1.11, this same Jesus, which is taken up from you into heaven, shall so come in like manner as, as ye have seen him go into heaven. Where did Christ go when he ascended up on high? Where did our mediator go? He assumed a new role. He ascended on high to finish his work as mediator for sinful men, to complete the union between God and us. 
Ellen White says, we see in the midst of the throne one bearing in hands and feet and side the marks of the suffering endured to reconcile man to God. Christ still bears those marks in heaven. We see a father infinite, dwelling in light unapproachable, yet receiving us from himself through the merits of his son. Jesus is now at the right hand of power. Mark 16, 19. So then after the Lord had spoken unto them, he was received up into heaven and sat on the right hand of God. Peter says in Acts 2, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, that he is at the right hand of God exalted. We now have a mediator, the man Christ Jesus, in his glorified humanity at the right hand of the Father. Stephen clearly says he saw him there. But he, being in the full of the Holy Ghost, looked up steadfastly into heaven right before he died and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing on the right hand of God. And he said, Behold, I see the heavens open and the Son of Man standing on the right hand of God. Friends, we have a mediator at the throne of heaven. Romans 8, 3 and 4. Who is he that condemneth? It is Christ that died, yet rather that is risen again, who is even at the right hand of God, who also makes intercession for us. We have a heavenly connection by faith. We have access to the throne of grace through our mediator. In Ephesians 1, Paul prays that our understanding could be open, that we may know what power we have. He says, and what is the great, exceeding greatness of his power to us who believe, according to the working of his mighty power, which he brought in Christ when he raised him from the dead and set him at his own right hand in the heavenly places. He says, far above all principality and power and might and dominion and every name that is named, not only in this world, but also in the world to come. Christ is at the right hand of the throne of heaven. And Christ isn't just geographically at the right hand of the throne of God in heaven. The right hand of God denotes a position of authority, a position of power. God says when he made creation, it was by the hand of God. The Egyptians were overcome by the hand of God. Psalms 89, 13, thou hast a mighty arm, strong is thy hand and high is thy right hand. What God's telling us is that we have access to power. Revelation 3, 21 says, to him that overcometh will I grant to sit with me in my throne, even as I also am overcome, uh, overcame and sat down with my father in his throne. In Philippians 2, Paul's mind was overwhelmed with the thought <clears throat> that this mediator, this Christ, who came and died on Calvary, who became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross, that this Christ is now at the right hand of the throne in heaven. Philippians 2.9, Wherefore God also hath highly exalted <coughs> him, and given him a name which is above every name. He isn't merely exalted. He's highly exalted. The Greek is hooper, oopso. It's a contraction of two words. Hooper means to exalt to the highest rank and power and to raise to supreme majesty. And oopso is to lift up on high, to exalt. Our mediator is now super exalted. Philippians 2.10, that, that at the name of Jesus... Every knee should bow of things in heaven and things on earth and things under the earth. One author says Paul stresses Christ's lordship. He calls him Lord more than 200 times. He says of Christ in Ephesians 1.21, he is far above all principality and power and might and dominion and every name that is named. And then he says in Colossians 2.10, and you, you are complete in him, which is the head of all principality and power. That is the exalted, super exalted position of our mediator. And the really mind-boggling thing is that Christ, though super exalted at the head of the universe, that Christ can understand your weakness. That Christ can understand the weakest of the weak. He knows our temptations. He doesn't know our temptations by infinite knowledge. He knows them by experience. Hebrews 4, 14. Seeing then that we have a great high priest that has passed into the heavens, 
Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our profession. For we have not a high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmity. That means he has a fellow feeling. He can, he, he can be sympathized with us. He was at all points tempted like as we are yet without sin. Let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Do you realize what strength there is in this, friend? You may be weak. You may be down. But your mediator understands your weakness. Amen. Does that, your, your mediator, your super exalted mediator understands your weakness. Amen. Desire of ages. The elder brother of our race is by the eternal throne. He looks upon every soul who is turning his face towards him as the Savior. He knows by experience what are the weaknesses of humanity and what are our wants and where lies the strength of our temptations. For he was in all points tempted like as we are yet without sin. He's watching over you, trembling child of God. Are you tempted? He will deliver. Are you weak? He will strengthen. Are you ignorant? He will enlighten. Are you wounded? He will heal. The Lord telleth the number of the stars, and he heals the broken in heart and binds up their wounds. Desire of Ages tells us the type of humanity Christ humbled himself to take was not the unfallen humanity that Adam had when he was in the garden. Oh, no. She says it was not thus with Jesus when he entered into the wilderness to cope with Satan. Christ took upon himself the infirmities, she says, of degenerate humanity. For 4,000 years, the race had been decreasing in physical strength and mental power and in moral worth, and Christ took upon them the infirmities of degenerate humanity. Only thus could he rescue man from the lowest, lowest depths of degradation. Amen. That's the depths your mediator went to for you. Amen. You know, there's a world of difference between getting help from somebody who simply cares and one who has been through the same experience that you were seeking help for. Many years ago, I worked as a lifestyle counselor at a health institute, and I always cringed when they would do the live-in, stop smoking program. I never smoked. I couldn't be caring. I could be willing to help, but I was. But the really effective counselors were those who had been former smokers. Jesus fasted 40 days in the wilderness. He knows by experience the cravings of the smoker. He knows by experience the cravings of the drug addict. Christ on the cross, he knows by experience the lowest depths of degradation. Christ was bearing the weight of the sins of the whole world. He was cut off from his father's presence. He had no comforter, human or divine. He could not see the father's reconciled face. We are told that Satan pulled out all his forces. Legions of evil angels surrounded the, the cross. All was oppressive gloom, not one ray of hope at the cross. Satan, speaking through the priest, hurled the sarcastic taunt at the Savior. If, ha ha, if you be the Son of God, why don't you come down now? Mm. If you're the King of Israel, let him now come down from the cross, and we will believe him. Christ could have wiped the bloody, what bloody sweat off his brow. He could have said, it's enough. And he could have come down. But he didn't. He didn't because he wanted to be your mediator. He didn't because he loved you and he remained there. Yeah. It was as if Christ was in a sea of evil, drowning in it, the devil, the devil pushing his head under every time he tried to come up for air. Finally, by faith, Christ pushed up through the stinking swamp of evil and in clear trumpet-like tones, Jesus' voice sounded out, Father! Father! I know you're there. Into thy hands I commit my spirit. Father, into your hands, Satan, you will not cut me off from my father. I will not be drowned. By faith, Christ triumphs over evil friends. Amen. You'll never be that low. Christ knows by experience. He triumphs over the forces of hell. 
And then he breathed out his final breath, rested his head upon his breast, and died. That is our mediator, friend. That is Christ, the lion and the lamb, the super exalted one in heaven's throne. He knows by experience the lowest depths of depression. He hears the anguished cry of the desperate, struggling soul who can only say, Lord, save me. This is Jesus. This is Jesus. The exalted, super exalted one lifted up on high above every created thing in the universe. One with the eternal Father in heaven. And yet understanding by experience the condition of one at the lowest depths of degradation. One down in the gutter at rock bottom. This is Jesus, your advocate in heaven. This Jesus, we are told, is now in the presence of God for us, Hebrews 9, 24. He is now to appear in the presence of God for us. He is our advocate, 1 John 2, 1. And if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. Roy Gain, an Adventist author, writes regarding Christ as our mediator. He says, for a long time, I was puzzled about Christ's role as our advocate. Is the Father so angry he needs to see Christ's blood again in order to calm down? Are the Father's wishes concerning us so antagonistic to the desires of Christ that he must plead, please, Father, please forgive them because of my sacrifice? He says these scenarios do not fit well with what we know of God from the rest of the Bible. Christ doesn't plead in the sense of begging or nagging. He pleads in the sense in which an advocate or a defense attorney stands up and pleads for his client in a court of law. He pleads. He has the evidence. Our trial involves our request for forgiveness and cleansing. Christ has evidence. The evidence Christ presents is that which proves God's right to forgive us. And that evidence, the fact is of the evidence, it's that Christ Sacrifice is the evidence. That's the only evidence that's effective. Our mouths are shut in this trial. We have nil, not one scrap of exonerating evidence in ourselves. Not one iota. Romans 3.19. Now we know that what things the law said, it said to them who are under the law, that every mouth may be stopped, and all the world become guilty before God. Our mighty mediator has his perfect righteousness that he pleads for us, and that will clinch our case. Amen. Romans 3, 24 through 26, being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God has set forth to be a propitiation through faith in his blood, to declare his righteousness through the remission of sins that are past through the forbearance of God, to declare, I say at this time, his righteousness, that he might be just and the justifier of him that believe him in Jesus. Did you get it? It's his righteousness. It's his blood. That's what he pleads. It's evidence. Our advocate is not pleading for the Father to accept us. God is not so angry with us that his wrath needs to be appeased and he offers some sacrifice. God set forth in his love the propitiation. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. No, it's you and me that needs to be reconciled. It's you and me that bring up the problem. Colossians 1, 21 and 22, and you that were sometime alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works, yet now hath he reconciled in the body of his flesh through death to present you holy and unblameable and unreprovable in his sight. Christ has the evidence, friends. We don't have it. And we need to take hold of the gift. God couldn't change this law that man had transgressed in Romans 3.26, but he can still be just, it says. For the good of everyone involved, for the good of the universe, God must maintain his justice. But he satisfies his justice. He pays the penalty. God and Christ plead with us to accept the gift. It is not God that is alienated, it is us. Desire of ages. God did not change his law, but he sacrificed himself in Christ for man's redemption. God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself, 2 Corinthians 5.19. She says, the law requires righteousness, a righteous life, a perfect character, 
And this man has not to give. We don't have it. He cannot meet the claims of God's holy law. But Christ, coming to earth as a man, lived a holy life. Christ developed a perfect character. These he offers as a free gift to all who will receive them. His life stands for the life of men. Thus they have remission of sins that are passed through the forbearance of God. And she says, more than this, Christ imbues men with the attributes of God. He builds up the human character after the similitude of the divine character, a goodly fabric of spiritual strength and beauty. Thus the very righteousness of the law is fulfilled in the believer in Christ. God can be just, and the justifier of him which believeth in Jesus. It's his work all the way through. When we come to the foot of the cross in true repentance for sin, we are declared righteousness because of Christ's righteousness. Then God, who declares us righteousness, can actually begin to recreate us in his image. The evidence our advocates passionately present is his perfect righteousness, his sacrifice, his shed blood on Calvary. This is the evidence that flinches everything. Christ still bears the marks of Calvary in heaven now in his resurrected body. Jesus chose to reveal himself to doubting Thomas in his resurrected body. Thomas demanded that unless he see the nail prints in his hands and the wound in his side, he wouldn't believe. So Jesus came to him, and Jesus said to him, Reach hither thy finger, and behold my hands, and reach hither my, thy hand, and thrust it into my side, and be not faithless, but believing. Friend, don't be faithless. Center your faith on the slain lamb, pleading his blood. To John, the beloved disciple, was revealed in heaven in Revelation 5, 6, in the midst of the throne. And I beheld and lo, in the midst of the throne and of the four beasts, and in the midst of the elders stood a lamb as it had been slain, having seven horns and seven eyes. Your faith has to be on the cross. Amen. This is a symbolic vision. There's not a literal lamb bleeding at the throne of heaven, but there is a literal mediator with literal nail prints in his hand and literal wound in his side. John probably sees the lamb with the death wound still bleeding, a lamb slain for sacrifice in the sanctuary service. The form of the verb translated had been slain implies that the act of slaughter had taken place in the past, but its results remain. Thus, Christ's death, though in historical past, its results are ever fresh and ever availing for us. Amen. Notice, it says in Revelation 5, 6, the lamb is not laying down. It's very much alive. Amen. The lamb is standing. Stood a lamb. The lamb is victorious. The lamb has seven horns, perfect power. The lamb has seven eyes, perfect wisdom and intelligence. The results of Calvary are ongoing. They actually are eternal. Hebrews 10, 12 to 14. But this man, after he had offered one sacrifice for sin, this mediator, sat down on the right hand of God from henceforth, expecting until his enemies be made his footstool. You want to be a victor, friend? You want to be a victor, friend? You have to have Christ as your mediator. Amen. For by one offering, he has perfected forever them that are sanctified. Calvary has eternal results. Friends, we need to look up. Amen. We need to look up to our heavenly mediator. You know, I don't know about you, but so many times in our Christian walk, we're so prone to look at ourselves. We're so prone to look at someone else. We need to look up. Ephesians 2, 5 and 6, even when we were dead in sins, has quickened us together with Christ. By grace are you saved, and has raised us up together, and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. That's your destination place, friends. Better than any Caribbean cruise. That's your destination place in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Seven Bible commentary, the Lamb of God is represented before us as in the midst of the throne of God. He is the great ordinance by which man and God are united and commune together. Thus men are represented as sitting in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. This is the appointed place of meeting between God and humanity. Don't miss that appointment. Don't miss that appointment, friends. She says, speaking of the 1888 message, Ellen White says, the uplifted Savior is to appear in his efficacious work as the Lamb slain, sitting upon the throne to dispense the priceless covenant blessings, the benefits he died to purchase for every soul who should believe on him. Efficacious. It means capable of doing something. 
It means capable of, of producing an intended effect. When you come to Christ, it's going to do something to you. She continues, the efficacy of the blood of Christ was to be presented to the people with freshness and power that their faith might lay hold upon its merit. As the high priest sprinkled the warm blood upon the mercy seat, while the fragrant cloud of incense ascended before God, so while we confess our sins and plead the efficacy of Christ's atoning blood, our prayers are to ascend to heaven, fragrant with the merits of our Savior's character. Amen. So you may be unworthy. You may have a character that you feel doesn't meet up. But we have a mighty mediator, don't we? Amen. He pleads his blood. Let's go to him. Let's go to the appointed place of meeting where his remedy, his blood, his righteousness will be efficacious. It will do something. Hebrews 9, 11 through 14. But Christ being come a high priest of good things to come by a greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that is to say, not of this building, by his own blood, he entered in once into the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption for us, it says. How much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offers himself without spot to God, purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God? It's efficacious. It does something. Friends, we must look to our heavenly mediator. Our heavenly mediator is both our high priest and our sacrifice. Ellen White says, unless he makes it his life business to behold the uplifted Savior, and by faith to accept the merits which it is, privilege, it is his privilege to claim, the sinner can no more be saved than Peter could walk upon the water unless he kept his eyes fixed steadily upon Jesus. Did you get that? You can't be saved unless you look to your mediator. No wonder Paul writes in Hebrews 8, verse 1, Hebrews 8, verse 1, he says, Now of the things which we have spoken, this is the sum. This is the point I want you to get, he says. We have such a high priest. Not just a high priest, we have such a high priest. Who is set on the right hand of the throne of the majesty in heaven. That's the sum, the, the chief, the main point. That we have such a high priest. One like this. One at the right hand of the throne of God. One who is both divine and human. And he knows by experience our weakness. Our high priest is also our lawyer in the heavenly court. Pleading the evidence of his own blood, of his own perfect righteousness. Paul says of such a high priest in Hebrews 7, 25 and 26. Wherefore, he is able to save them to the uttermost that come unto God by him. Is your advocate able to take care of your Amen. Amen. Seeing he ever liveth to make intercession for them. For such a high priest became us, or is fitting for us. He is holy. He is harmless. He is undefiled. He is separate from sinners, and he is made higher than the heavens. That's your high priest. That's your mediator. Friends, we have the amazing privilege of coming to our mediator, where he was holy. He was harmless. He presents his perfect righteousness in place of our dead work. Hebrews 12, verse 2 says, Jesus, we have to look unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, for the joy that was set before him and heard the cross, despising this chain, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. It says Christ is the author, and he's also the finisher. The word finisher means he perfects it, one who brings something to completion without defect or blemish. Christ is your mediator at the start of your race and every step of the way. And he intends to bring you to the finish line. Amen. He is by the eternal throne, the lamb slain with seven horns and seven eyes. This is the only power, the only intelligence that can bring you to the end of the race, to bring you home. He is the finisher. The whole of our salvation from beginning to end, friends, is a gift to our mediator. Ephesians 2, 8 through 10. For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. Even faith is a gift. Ephesians 2, 9. Not of works, lest any man should boast. Christ is the author, but he doesn't stop there. He's with us every step of the way. Isaiah 58, 8. 
It says, Thy righteousness shall go before thee, and the glory of the Lord shall be thy reward. Christ is in the front. Christ is in the rear. There's a 15-year-old, 1,500-year-old prayer which still stirs one's heart. It's called St. Patrick's Bless Breastplate. Here's part of it. Christ be with me. Christ in the front. Christ in the rear. Christ within me. Christ below me. Christ above me. Christ at my right hand. Christ at my left. Christ in the floor. Christ in the chariot seat. Christ at the helm. Christ in the heart of every man who thinks of me. Christ in the mouth of every man who speaks to me. Christ in every eye that sees me. Christ in every ear that hears me. Amen. This, friend, in Ephesians 2, this grace is not only at the beginning, it's also at the end. Ephesians 2, 8, for by grace are you saved through faith. It is the gift of God. And this gift includes verse 10, for we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before again that we should walk with them. The whole work of salvation is a gift for a mediator. It's a gift all the way through. Well, some of may say, turn there with me if you would. Philippians chapter 2. Turn to Philippians chapter 2 there, verse 12. And somebody may say there, well, it says you're to work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. This is true. This is true. We cannot rely on someone else. We have to dive into the water. We have to get wet. We have to put forth an effort. But notice the verse just following, which is part of the same thought. What does it say? For it is God which worketh in you, both to will and to do of his good pleasure. We must not only admire and behold the amazing grace that's given to us, we have to make it our own. We have to take, taste, and see. We have to take hold and eat the bread of heaven. Ellen White says, to make God's grace our own, we must act our part. His grace is given to work in us, to will and to do, but never as a substitute for our effort. Christ has great plans for us if we come and take hold of him. Amen. I'm interviewing Dr. A.J. Gordon as a prospective pastor of the Boston Church. The pulpit committee asked him, if you are called to the pastor of our church, will you preach against the cards, the theater, and dancing? I will. Solemnly affirmed Dr. Gordon. He was called to the position. Months passed, and he didn't say one word against the cards, the theater, and dancing. The official board of the church said, almost a year has gone by, and you said nothing against cards, the theater, and dancing. We wonder, you know, why? Dr. Gordon replied as follows. Gentlemen, it is true I have said nothing against these things, but I have preached Christ, who is the only Savior from all evils. When he comes into one's heart, all evil things vanish from the light like the mist before the hot breath of the noonday sun. Mm. Jesus tells us the only way that we can grow in grace is to abide in him, right? Amen. Abide in me, he says. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself except it abide in the vine, no more can ye except ye abide in me. Without me, you can do how much? Nothing. Nothing. Friends, sometimes we get the idea that we have to do some part of the work in our own strength. But Ellen White says, in Steps of Christ, every such effort must fail. We don't want to fail. Jesus says, without me, you can do nothing. Our growth in grace, our joy, our usefulness, all depend upon our union with Christ. Amen. It is by communion with him daily, hourly, by abiding in him that we are to grow in grace. He is not only the author, but the finisher of our faith. It is Christ first and last and only. He is to be with us, not only at the beginning and the end of our course, but at every step of the way. Amen. I'd like to close with this thought from Ellen White in the devotional book, Lift Him Up. She says, for by grace are you saved through faith and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. The thought that the righteousness of Christ is imputed to us, not because of any merit on our part, but as a free gift from God is a precious thought. The enemy of God and man is not willing that this truth should be clearly presented. For he knows that if the people receive it fully, his power will be broken. 
You want Satan's power to be broken? If he can control mind so that doubt and unbelief and darkness shall compose the experience of those who claim to be the children of God, he can overcome them with temptation. You want to be overcome with temptation? Do you want to get victory? The simple faith which takes God in his word should be encouraged. God's people must have the faith which will lay hold on divine power. For by grace are you saved through faith, and that is not to yourself, but the gift of God. Those who believe that God, for Christ's sake, has forgiven their sins should not, through temptation, fail to press on to fight the good fight of faith. Do we have the struggle? Yes, but it's a struggle of victory. Amen. You know, do you like to climb mountains? You get hot and sweaty, but you get to the top, right? And you enjoy the beautiful view. God wants to take us up the mountain to the heavenly view. Their faith should grow stronger. As we get near the top, our steps quicken, right? Their faith should grow stronger until their Christian life, as well as their words, shall declare the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses us from all sin. First John 1, 7. Amen. Amen. Friends, we have a mighty heavenly mediator. Let us look to him. Our closing song is number 229, All Hail the Power of Jesus.